I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Institute for Continuing Learning, Young Harris College, and the Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're delighted today to have our, as our guest Tommy Irving, Georgia's longtime agriculture commissioner, who I might say probably knows more about Georgia politics than anybody you'll ever meet. He has run for election and been elected 10 consecutive times to an office uh, that is statewide and attracts a lot of attention from potential candidates. So, Tommy, welcome to you. We're delighted to have you. Bob, it's a pleasure to be with you. Good. Our association goes back for many, many years and always valued the friendship we've had and the time that we worked together. I think uh, was kind of one of the highlights of uh, my early years in, in government. You know, I showed up on Capitol Hill and nobody knew who I was and I didn't know anybody either. So, but we'll talk a little bit about that later on as we move Good. further into the program about some of the things that we were involved in together. Good, uh, uh, Mr. Commissioner, we're very interested now in you. Uh, if you will, tell us a little bit about yourself and. You grew up on a, a real mountain farm. Well, I, uh, my, my parents were what you call sharecroppers. You know. uh, they used to call it third and fourth. Part of, part of your production was to pay for the land that you cultivated. I was born in a little town called Lula, Georgia. It uh, straddles uh, both Hall and Havers, uh, and Banks, Banks County. I was born on the Hall County side. And then my family moved from there over into White County when I was still a young lad. And I still remember uh, uh, having to get up and hitch up the mules and plow the fields. And I, I used to tell folks that um, we grew a little cotton on the farms but back then. You don't grow any cotton in that part of the state now. And uh, the red clay would uh, get hard and you had to be very careful that uh, you didn't let the red clay uproot the young cotton as it emerged from the soil. And I, I'll always remember uh, having to uh, plow the fields when, when you were getting ready to lay your corn by. You always do what we call bust the middles. Uh, I know when I was chosen as commissioner of agriculture, one of the, uh, the uh, editorial writers for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, I won't know uh, what I knew about farming. I said, well, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess I knew everything that you needed to know. I knew how to tie a ham spring, and I knew G, and I knew Ha, I knew what that meant. And I, uh, I uh, knew, knew how to keep the, cow, uh, keep the horse from walking on the cotton when he was young, it's it up on it. And I knew how to put on a set of Johnson wings. He said, what's that? I said, well, I thought that's where I'd lose you. <laughs> But that was part of the implements that you put on the plow stock to, when you, when you plow, uh, you'd uh, bust out the furrow with that Johnson wings. One of the things I used to do is take the plows and the Johnson wings and sweeps and things of that nature down to a, a blacksmith shop to sharpen and see them heat, heat them up and beat them out, you know. And you couldn't afford to buy anything new back then in those days because you didn't have any money. And most everything you did was bartering, and I know when we would sell our cotton in the fall of the year, uh, we would be uh, uh, go into town, uh, into Canoe, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you'd get you a pair, a new pair of overalls and a shirt, one pair of shoes, and if you wore them out before the winter was over, you'd have to put some paper pasteboard in them to keep them from uh, your feet from intruding through the wore out shoes of that type during that day. And uh, it, was a, it was quite an experience. And I, I know when uh, I uh, first became commissioner of agriculture making speeches down in the southern part of the state, entirely different from what we had in the northern part of Georgia. Uh, I have somebody says, a uh, commissioner says, uh, how many bushel of corn did you, you get in those little bottom lands? Uh, I said, bushels. <laughs> I said, the people in North Georgia sold it by the gallon. 
<laughs> that was a joke, of course. That was ethanol. It's also true. <laughs> we called it moonshine back yeah. then. Yeah. The same product we call ethanol now. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience. I, um, I became very interested in, in community affairs. Uh, I know after uh, I, Bernice and I met uh, riding a school bus out to the old southeastern fair and I was a I was telling the driver how to go out how to get there. You didn't have the expressway through Atlanta back in those days and I'd been there before and and uh, I kept noticing this young lady sitting back there with a young man in the back of the bus and stopped up about uh, Buford and he went out to get a, a soft drink and he, you know, he came back, I had his seat, and he never did get it back. <laughs> <laughs> I told her, I guess we fell in love at the first, first sight. First sight, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, a, it's been a, a great union. We've been married more than 60 years now, and uh, this coming uh, June, uh, 08 will be, uh, June 1 will be 61 years. And this day and time, that's quite a record. Yes, it is. But uh, my, 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 uh, my daddy was a sawmiller, and he got killed working at the sawmill. And I remember during World War II, uh, I was not old enough to be drafted. And uh, in the summertime, I, I would help off by the sawmill, and I tell him I knew the difference between uh, slabs and strips, <laughs> and the difference between lumber and and uh, and, uh, and waste. And uh, it to uh, give me. A lot of great training. My dad uh, was very close. He was my buddy. You know, uh, most young people, they, they cling to their mother. I, my mother was a very delightful person and great cook and a hard worker. And, and she, was, uh, she was a Hogan. And a Hogan, her, 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 her father, my grandfather, was, was a congregation holist. I know he used to sit in the, in the choir and never sing a note, but he, he'd clap, stay right in tune with the music. But uh, my, my wife um, influenced me uh, to go to church, and I was saved at Antioch Baptist Church where I, where I belong now. And uh, all of our children came along and accepted the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, their personal Savior at that church, and they don't all live in our, in our community now, so they belong to different churches, but uh, some of them still do. And we've, uh, we have 14 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, uh, eight, eight grandsons and six granddaughters. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I got interested in, in community affairs. Uh, my first uh, Public service was board of trustees of Hazel Grove Elementary School, where, where my son James and Johnny and David all attended, and London and Lisa all attended at, at elementary school. And later, I became a, a, a trustee of back then called North North Haversham at Clarksville, Georgia, and uh, I uh, was selected to, and elected by the by the uh, grand jury to serve on the Board of Education. And uh, that really got me involved in, uh, in public service in a, in a very visible way. I, I guess everything I ever did, I tried to get in it where I could be, uh, show some degree of hopefully mm -hmm. persuasion. You call it leadership today, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I served um, later as in line and served as state president of the Georgia School Board Association. But my interest in, in Atlanta was because uh, I felt that uh, our local representative was not representing us properly. And I joined with a carload of people going down to the Capitol and trying to persuade him to allow us to have a referendum on a piece of legislation dealing with how we change our local government. And for some reason he didn't he didn't feel like he wanted to, uh, to accommodate us, and I, I could tell it made a lot of people very upset at him. And uh, he went ahead and passed the bill without a referendum. I, I hadn't given any thought about running for the legislature at that time, but I was, we, we had cows on, on it. Would you like to take a break? 
Ask no, some I'm questions, fine. Long. No, you, no, you're doing well. I thought if you did. No, sir. I, 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 we kept cows on our farm. Before I'd go off to the lumber mill, I would, um, I would milk the cows early in the morning. And I remember one this morning, uh, I heard some people coming down behind the house toward the barn. I could hear them, and I recognized at least part of the voices. And said, we come to see if we could convince you to run for the state legislature. And I said, well, uh, I'm not sure I could run for the county line. <laughs> I never, uh, I'd been on the school board and I'd been very active there, but uh, it had not, uh, it had not uh, uh, built a base broad enough to run uh, in a countywide election. He came back the second morning with another group with him, the leader of the group, and came back the third morning and, and he got me to, to, to uh, Say, I, I would look into it. And I took a day off from work and began to travel around through the county. And, uh, and uh, I had uh, done a little singing, and in most of the country churches, at one time or another, my wife and I had sang in them. After I accepted the, the, the Lord, uh, we got into music. And uh, I, uh, I'd go knock on these doors and says, oh, I know you, you sing in our church. So I suppose that, that helped me a lot in my first election. And uh, we had a very, another very prominent businessman running against the incumbent. And I got more votes than both of them as a newcomer. But that's kind of how it started. And I, I guess um, not too long after that's when I, on that period of time is when I met you. And yeah. We yeah. got involved in another very important endeavor. Yeah. When you were, you, you got four terms in the legislature. Four terms in the legislature. and. And uh, four terms on, on the school board. The school board terms were five years, and legislature, of course, were two. two years. Uh -huh. uh, and I, uh, I was uh, very happy to serve in the legislature. I had a, I had a local um, businessman attorney uh, had, uh, invited me to go in the line. Said I want to introduce you to a man running for governor. And I says, Who is it? He says, Lester Maddox. I said, you know Lester Mattis? He said, yes. Said, you know, I moved up here to Haversham County from, from Atlanta and had supported him, I think, when he ran, ran for mayor of Atlanta. And uh, he carried me down, and uh, we went into the old Henry Grady Hotel. Back in that day, we did everything political. That's where it was handled on, 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 on Capitol Square. And uh, I... Uh, I um, went with him and we went into the hotel there and his, uh, his daughter and his sister was all, there, all I could see was running this, had his office open and said, wait around, said he'd be back in a little while. We sat around a while and I don't know, kind of killed time, but he came back in and he came through there and hugged Jack Gunner, who later was our judge, as you know, in this circuit up here. Mountain Circuit, back when it was a Mountain Circuit. And uh, he, uh, he introduced me to, to, to Mr. Maddox. And we were sitting there talking and having lunch together. And I, I suspect after about an hour of, uh, of talking about everything we could think of on, on the agenda, uh, he made the statement, he says, uh, I want you to manage my campaign. And uh, I said, well, uh, I said, I can't manage my own. How could I manage yours? Well, I want you to do that. You know, the amazing thing about that, I, I did not give him a, a direct uh, answer that day. He was anxious to get me to that day to tell him whether I would uh, help in his uh, efforts to be governor. But uh, I, uh, I uh, put him off. I went around to see some of uh, prominent friends that supported me for the le legislature. By that time, I had more than one term, you know, already behind me. And uh, they says, uh, uh, are you crazy? Uh, you want to get out and try to get that man elected governor? Uh, I had read a lot about him, and I, I knew his uh, image was not the best in the world. And as you and I found out later, he was much different from what his image was. A great man, very honest. But... Uh, 
out of say 12, 15 people I talked to, all of them are one, called me back and said, we reconsider. He says, uh, he might be governor. I said, you ought, you ought to go help him. And so I did. And as you know, we didn't get elected. We didn't get the most votes and end up legislature right. electing him. And I, I did whatever I could to, to make that happen. And uh, it's... Uh, there All was, this is before I became Commissioner of Agriculture. Right, there was a very historical thing that happened uh, during that period when there was, uh, when uh, Mr. Maddox had not been elected but would be elected, and that was legislative independence. Well, that came out of that. Uh, that, uh, that uh, I think, to, uh, let me kind of fill in the gap. So, you know, I met you then, and you became a part of his administration before I did, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And uh, he, he'd fired a young man he'd hired to be his, uh, I call it chief of staff, or the or executive secretary, the man that ran his office. And, and he called me up and says, uh, you've got, you got to come and run my office. He says, uh, you have to get me elected. Mm-hmm. Now you've got to have him be, be a decent governor. And uh, I, uh, I resigned from the legislature and went down and uh, uh, took over that office. And that, you and I worked in unison there for, for I guess all the time that I stayed as his chief of staff, right. you uh, you were a prominent member of the staff, and you had to, one of the toughest jobs at all because you had to you had to work on his image. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, I know you were his speechwriter. I think I'm right on all this. Yeah. I'm not you can correct it. And uh, you I wrote uh, some speeches. You uh, yeah. you, uh, you would along with others uh, help advise him, mm-hmm. and uh, if you could get him to you get him to. Uh, Calm down before he get excited. He made some very solid decisions and and good decisions for his time. Uh, I, I know that uh, that uh, one of the things that influenced me a lot to know that he how, how he really wanted to make things happen. He did away with the patronage system. Uh, it, it, we had up until that time, if you wanted a job of the state, you had to get permission from the governor. You'll see the governor. And uh, he he did away with that, and he uh, he did away with, with some other practices that cost a lot of taxpayers money. He was a very 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 strong conservative on how he spent your tax money, and uh, we can't can't get away from the fact that he was a segregationist, but not a racist. He probably, uh, with your help and my help and guiding him, pointed more blacks to, to uh, boards and bureaus and every governor prior to that time put together. Well, I think he was the first. Well, he, some very important posts, he was the first. Yeah. And, and he picked good, solid people, and, and uh, they made him, uh, they made him uh, uh, become a very moderate governor on social events. Right. And uh, he, uh, he, only governor to ever run for lieutenant governor and win. That's true, yeah. <laughs> But let, let, uh, me, uh, let me get back a minute to uh, your becoming uh, Commissioner of uh, Agriculture. Uh, were you at the uh, 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago? We, if, if you remember, you and I and, and uh, I don't know a couple other prominent business people, professional people there in the Atlanta area, um, went through the list of potential people back in those days, the governor really picked the delegates. Right. And we had the, I guess, the best cross-section delegates were blacks and, and whites and women that state had ever had before. But he got challenged by Julian Bond. And, uh, and the challenge uh, took, took half our delegates away from us, half of the votes. And um, a lot of the prominent people came back home. We had five of our other constitutional officials, and, including the Commissioner of Agriculture and the Commissioner of Insurance. And, and, uh, Public commi- Service Commission. Public Service Commission. State Treasurer. State Treasurer at that time, Jack Ray. And uh, they all switched parties. And uh, I know that uh, we had a meeting up in the... I, I, I may better not say the office building because I can't remember exactly where it was downtown, but where the party met for for business meetings. 
And uh, some of them said, well, we'll just turn it over to, to, uh, to the, the challengers. And I said, no. I said, we got an obligation. I said, you're the governor. We can't totally destroy the, the, the authority of the governor because we've got to have a strong governor. You've got to have somebody that can lead, make things happen. And uh, we, uh, we're going to put together uh, uh, some delegates that would, uh, would do a good job. And then when we came back home, we had to pick the electors. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know you had to do that far. far. That's a new experience for me. But we, uh, we, uh, we picked good, solid people. And uh, everybody came out, I guess, a step ahead of the system. Mm -hmm. But Camo got an appointment as Under Secretary of Agriculture with Richard Nixon. Right. And uh, front page of the Atlanta Journal Constitution, uh, Maddox says if Kemmel goes to Washington, Irvin will be the new Ag Chief. Mm -hmm. Here they come. Uh, uh, to, to me, and I said, well, the governor and I never discovered that. He says, you mean he's going to announce he's going to appoint you something and never discovered it? I said, we discovered everybody else. Never discovered <laughs> me. I said, I, I, I didn't have any interest in anything else other than what I was doing. But as it turned out, uh, you know, Campbell went to Washington, and uh, I went over as Ag Chief, and I remember the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and one of the editorials, I hope I remember this pretty well accurately as it, as it was uh, printed, uh, Irvin will keep the seat warm until the people of Georgia can choose them an Ag Chief. Well, that's, you that's, kept the seat warm. That's nearly 40 years 40 ago. years, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, an interesting thing about that was that uh, that uh, Jimmy Bentley, who was Controller General, and, and Jack Ray, and uh, those party switchers, all ran for office uh, the, at the next election, and they all were defeated. They ran as Republicans, and uh, and they all lost. So I guess you could say the only one that really uh, made out in that party switch was uh, Phil Campbell, who got a position in Washington. But you got to be agriculture commissioner. Tremendous department. A lot of responsibility. Well, I, I, you know, I never dreamed that we had such broad responsibility. It was, uh, the general public now doesn't know the depth of the responsibility that office has. It's, you know, a lot of people have encouraged me uh, throughout the year to run for governor. I've never ever seriously considered it because I never have had what you call the fire in the belly. Uh, that's not too good a grammar, but that's that's what they used to say. You had to have that if you want to be want to run and get elected governor. And uh, I uh, I've just enjoyed uh, very much the challenges that uh, that that comes with the job that I've been able to hold for all these years. And I think over the years we've uh, we've had a great influence on a lot of policy nationwide. You know, agriculture is a is, is, is a great, great industry. Uh, we're the number one producer of chicken. Uh, we've always been the number one producer in peanuts. Uh, we were, back when we used to have a lot of tobacco, we were number th three in the production of tobacco. Uh, after, we, after I led, the, along with other leaders, uh, the eradication of the bull weevil, uh, we were number two in cotton. And uh, we, 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 we have an emerging fresh fruits and vegetable industry that's just humming. Uh, it's, it's got great opportunities to expand and, and I'm pushing very hard and giving it strong support from our office to, to see uh, us grow a lot of those things that we used to ship in from other parts of the country and sometimes uh, even from Central America or South America because we didn't didn't produce it in our own home state and in our own home communities. Well, in addition to promotion, your department uh, has a lot of responsibilities in food safety. Well, food safety, I made that, I made that our number one mission. Uh, you know, there's been a lot in the media in the last couple of three years uh, about uh, contaminated food and recalls, getting more recalls now than ever in the history of the state. Every time there's been a recall, we're, we're working hand in glove with the local communities. If it's something the feds discovered, hand in glove with the feds, we, we go in with them and 
help them make a recall successful, uh, to make sure that uh, contaminated food didn't get in the hands of our consumers. And uh, that'll continue to be a great challenge in the future uh, because uh, it, you have to put a lot of man hours and, and, and uh, the morning, the afternoon we're taping this program here. Uh, I got a call from my PR department and we got two re recalls going on now. And one of them, it, uh, we had to go into the facilities and pull it off the shelf and then use the media to notify people if you got some at home, return it. Um, don't, don't take a chance, it might be harmful to you. Do you do those inspections? Does the state of Georgia do the inspections? We do, we, we're, the, we're the kind of the lifeblood of that program. Uh, we have 60 something, what we call sanitarians, for food safety inspectors. And I believe the last time I talked in that work in that particular field, the food and drug only had about six or seven for three or four southern states. So we, we have to do the job. We got the manpower to keep, keep the food out of the hands of, uh, of our consumers, something that should, should never been put in the marketplace to begin with. Uh, one of the things we're gonna to hope to be able to announce soon, we're working now with some very prominent ag leaders to do more, for them to do more individual testing in themselves. Uh, our ability to discover now is unlimited. Uh, technology has come a long, long ways, and if, if it's something out there that's contaminated, if you test it, you'll find it before it gets into general circulation. That's what I want to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have the resources to do all of it ourselves because it just takes, takes a, lot of, a lot of man hours, but it takes a lot of money, and that's taxpayers' money. But uh, if we get all this worked out, we, we'll be announcing it probably before this will be uh, fully edited, and maybe we can put a little stuff say we got it done. Yeah. Uh, we're importing now a tremendous amount of food from foreign countries, uh, China. Uh, should we worry about that? Well, I, you know, I'm always asking the feds to do more. But I'm also asking the legislature to give us resources so we can do more. Uh, you, can, you cannot imagine the tons of food that comes into Atlanta by air. And that's the busiest airport in the world. And every time one comes in from any, most any foreign country has containers of food aboard. And we expect to have within the next year at least one inspector stationed at the Atlanta airport to check all that food as it comes in. I think it'll, it'll put us ahead of any other country, any other state that I know of in the U.S. in do, doing uh, this kind of inspection service. Uh, we, we need to do more at, 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 the, at the ports because a lot, of, a lot of it comes in by ship. And uh, so, so there's room to improve. But we, we check it when it gets out into the general warehouses. If we don't catch it, before it gets off of the off of ships or boats or off of the planes. And we have a good good law because if we find it is uh, contaminated, uh, we can do, we can stop it right in its tracks. Food and Drug has to go to court and get a court order to do that. So we got a really better law than, they, than, than the Food and Drug has. Why are we importing so much food? Well, we're, we're uh, you know, we're, we're great consumers ourselves. Uh, we're, we're one of the biggest consumer, population-wise, one of the biggest consumers in the world. And uh, we want our consumers to have all these different choices. And you can't possibly produce everything that they want, so why not uh, have a program to bring it in and, and uh, put some restrictions on them. I know when we started getting some contaminated food coming into Georgia from California, that's a big, big uh, ag state. A lot of people don't realize, a lot of people live in California, but it's the number one ag state in the nation. And uh, we, uh, we urge them to do what I've just mentioned to you, do a lot of testing for the Senate here. Because when they sit here, I'm gonna test it, and if there's anything wrong with it, we're gonna turn it down and require them to, to destroy it. But if they test it, they can save a lot of expense. But uh, China will continue to be a huge, huge marketer for our products. 
Uh, the governor informed me a few days ago that he's going to support my efforts to, for us to have an office, agricultural office in, in China. And uh, we're going to be moving forward with that uh, shortly. And uh, if we're going to expect him to buy products from here, we got to accept products from there. As you know, one of the, one of the countries that I've been a national leader in is Cuba. Uh, Cuba most do business with us. We're doing some. Our government's a little bit antiquated. Our president don't want to allow us to have face-to-face -face trade with them. But I think we've got to. I, I remember I was the first ag chief in the nation to advocate doing business years ago with the old Soviet Union. And uh, I know that uh, during that earlier stages when I was advocating doing business with, with the Soviets, before they were called Russia and St. Petersburg, uh, I'd be in a civic club, most any town in Georgia, and somebody would like to get up and say, you want to do business with the communists? I said, no, I want to do business. How can you justify doing business with the communists? I said, well, I happen to believe if we have food that they, they need and they want, and it's a market for us, they will not be sending a rocket ship over to pick it up. <laughs> and uh, I, I, get a big, I get a big applause from the audience. And I, I think trade has probably done more to help us have a, a good relationship with, with the Russian people now than anything else that was done. And I think agriculture and maybe some things that I had a little part in might help bring it to be in. And I, I, I think we can have the same kind of relationship with Castro country. He, he, he's, Fidel is out of the picture now and his brother's running the country, but I expect that we're gonna see things get more moderate to how they deal with their people. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to some great time, great trade opportunities with the, with the Cuban people in the future. Speaking of trade, uh, how has NAFTA affected agriculture in Georgia? Well, NAFTA has been a disappointment to a lot of people. As you know, if you've been following the, the debates, and especially on the presidential Democrat side, there's been a lot said about, uh, about uh, NAFTA. If NAFTA had worked like he should have, he could be very helpful. But it's turned into having so many negatives that I don't know whether we'll ever be able to make it successful or not. Uh, I have to admit, I, I urge members of Congress to vote for it originally. If I was urging them today, I'd urge them to vote against it. Because uh, uh, they want to sell to us, and they want to make it difficult for us to sell to them. And they got tariffs on our products going into their country, and they want us to let their, their products come into here without any tariffs. And that's not, that's not fair trade. But uh, that, we, 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 we're going to get out from under that. I know we was talking about doing business with, uh, with Russia. Uh, I get in some of these uh, settings, and I said, well, if you uh, want us to buy your underwear, underwear for me to wear, I want you to make it out of Georgia cotton. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, you get a good laugh, but there's a lot of truth to that because, uh, you know, a lot of our jobs for well, that type has already left us. And I'm not sure if someone will ever be able to get them back, but if, if we can have a trade, uh, they can fill some of the gaps. Let's talk for a minute about ethanol. Ethanol is an agricultural product. Uh, how do you see that uh, situation panning out with regard to our energy dependence? Well, let's go back up a little bit. And you remember when we used to have a product called gasol? Absolutely the same product. Alcohol is alcohol. And I, I uh, had urged um, as we move into ethanol now to get us a feeder stock that was not competitive with what we eat. Uh, corn has been so many different products. It's driven up the price to where now we're getting scanned. I, I, maybe I should say you're getting politically skinned. Scan. <laughs> and um, if we could um, really get our research to do what they, I know they're working at the university to try to achieve where pine trees and, and grasses and, 
and other products could be used for feeder stock, I think it could have a great, uh, great future. But if we're going to have to make it out of corn and it shoots up like it is recently at $6 a bushel, mm. you, can't, you, you can't make ethanol out of $6 a bushel of corn. And you can't afford to pay that for every, every piece of cornmeal or uh, every cereal or sh uh, the sugar that's made from, from corn. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a negative effect because it, it causes the price of food to go up. Everything from milk, beef, pork, uh, cereals, uh, all the other products that uh, I haven't talked to them recently, but I suspect Coca Cola is having to pay probably double or triple what they used to have to pay for the sweetener for the soft drinks. And anything that affects it that heavily, it becomes negative because it, it looks like it, it was a villain. When really the villain was for us pushing the product before we were ready to come up with a proper feeder stock that I'd advocated uh, to be the product that we make the ethanol from. But hopefully, hopefully we can have a discovery and be able to do that. And I know one plant that's been announced in Georgia, they say they're going to have some new technology. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And if it works, maybe we can get it back on the stream. If we don't, it'll never, it'll never advance like a lot of us would like to see. Speaking of food prices, they've, they've been creeping up over the past few years. Is, is that a temporary thing? Or? Well, I suspect that nothing's ever temporary. But I think we've got to get it under control. And I think the things we've talked about already is some of the things that's made this happen. If we can get that resolved, then I think we'll see it moderate back down. Maybe not to where it was, but it won't be, it won't be considered triple what it used to be. We, uh, we've been very fortunate in, in, in the U.S. and Georgia, as well as the rest of the U.S. throughout the years having very stable prices for the food that we eat. Uh, we get, I don't want to use the word cheap, but in some terms, what it would be with other countries, it had been very relatively cheap. And uh, so we, we now up where we, we're having to pay some about the same prices probably they're having to pay. And when you're having to pay $4 a gallon, I saw here, and I drove into town, $4 or something a gallon for diesel fuel to power your trucks to haul these products. That goes right back into the cost. You have your tractors, your, your pumps that pump the water for irrigation to farm, farms in the southern part of our state. Uh, it's going to be, they got to have these higher prices or they can't pay that price for the energy that, that, that it takes to, to, to do the producing. Uh, nitrogen is um, advancing so fast that I hear People that's in that business tell me that they will not price it for a delivery a week from now. They want to price it today. They make the, the, the delivery because it goes up every day. I heard on the news uh, uh, this morning that gas has been going up uh, one or two or three cents a gallon overnight and more than one day in a, in a row. We've never had that happen before in the history of, of, of America. And all that, all that inflationary prices uh, is affecting, affecting everything that we do, including the food that we produce and the food that we eat. Well, speaking of uh, immigration, well, what effect is, uh, is, is the current discussion of immigration having on Georgia agriculture? Well, so far it hasn't had a whole lot of effect. and uh, we got to have a sensible program. I know, I know there's a strong feeling from, from the general public. They want the illegals out of here. Uh, if we have somebody that's been working at the same place, same farm for the last eight or 10 years and they've been stable and uh, they uh, buy the food and pay the same taxes we pay, I think we gotta find a way to make them legal. And I'm not a citizen, not citizenship, but the green card, I think that's what they call it, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, uh, but I also heard of, that they're raiding some, some major chicken companies, and one of them has a presence here in Georgia, and, and, uh, and causing probably the plant to be closed down. I know back 
four or five years ago when the, the immigration people went out into the fields in South Georgia when, people, when these uh, uh, Hispanics were harvesting uh, our Vidae onions or harvesting our beans and our peas and squash and okra and, and tomatoes and our vegetable crops. Uh, those people armed going in the field, they, they run. I guess I was in a foreign country and I was working and I see somebody coming out with a bunch of armed people, I'd probably run too. But we got to work on that one. And, uh, and uh, I, I think it will be worked out. I felt, I felt all along this was a national issue and Congress owes it to the American people to, to adopt a sensible program to deal with this. And once they do that, I think all of us as leaders need to get behind whatever that program is and help make it work. It'll be teamwork, and I'm willing to do my part. Uh, I say don't make, don't give illegals citizenship, but make it possible for them to get, get a work card. Mm -hmm. And if they could work, they immediately ship back home. Well, now let's, uh, let's get on another subject here. You've done a great job with that department. It's one of the leading departments in the uh, country. But you also have had vast experience in dealing with important people in the state of Georgia. And I'd like to ask you about a few of them. Uh, of course, you were, you were very close to Governor Maddox. You were his floor leader and his executive secretary, and you served as a uh, as agriculture commissioner during his administration and for, what, 38 more years of other administrations. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Tell me, uh, uh, I think Marvin Griffin was governor when you came to the legislature. That's right? correct. Governor Griffin. Uh, what did you think about Governor Griffin? Well, you know, Griffin was, uh, I, I didn't vote for Griffin when he was elected. And when I got down to Capitol Hill, uh, Cheney aggravated me something awful. And he would call people up in, in Haversham County and, and he needed my vote and get him to call me and, and uh, twist my arm to get me to vote with him. And, and uh, they'd call me, but says, you vote your own convictions. And that's what I did. But Marvin uh, tr tried to enact some legislation that just wouldn't go. I know one of, the, one, of the, one of the pieces of legislation that I was able to kill as a young legislator was one dealing with the with issue about uh, black or white. And this issue was that I think Georgia was planning to play one of the Pennsylvania colleges, either Penn State or Pittsburgh, and I don't, I don't remember which one, in the Sugar Bowl. Pittsburgh. And, and uh, they had a black on their team and he put, had put a bill in to prohibit uh, any school in Georgia from having athletic competition with a person of another race, had a person of another race on their team. Well, uh, you know that wouldn't work. And I led that fight and we killed that bill. And I got called down to the governor's office on that, but I thought I did the right thing. But he, he, uh, he was really the last of the, of the old segregation crowd. Uh, he uh, he came along at a time. I, I guess you needed to have that flavor to get elected. I, I know uh, Carl Sanders uh, was the first governor that uh, kind of broke ranks on that and tried to be have a moderate uh, a moderate uh, influence on, on the racial issues. And I know he uh, he during the campaign he called me out to the mansion a couple of times and. I met with him, and uh, we uh, we uh, were able to get some good pointers from him on how to advise uh, Governor Maddox. And as I said early on in this program, you and I, I think, had a lot of influence on getting him to, to, to take center stage and be moderate on, on social issues. But uh, Carl did not have the success that Lester did on his appointments. Carl made some good appointments, but he, he, the racial issue was still in there, I guess, then. And some of his good appointments could, couldn't get elected to the ballot box. Lester's yeah. did. Yeah. And that was kind of amazing, I guess, to all of us to see how things could happen. And then uh, uh, 
Ernest, uh, Ernest Vandenberg came along and uh, I, know, I know that uh, I, uh, I think he, uh, he tried to move it in that direction. And we've been steadily, I think, dealing with that issue about as well as any state in, in, in the nation. I think, I think Georgia's really been uh, the, prim, the empire state of the South. And I think we've demonstrated very, very well in that field. And I think we've lived up to all the good credentials that, that he could give us. You worked very closely with uh, Senator Talmadge when he was chairman of the Agriculture Committee. Well, he was, he was, um, he was very important to me in my earlier days. Uh, he, uh, he was very helpful. And uh, I don't mind telling you that uh, when my good friend Zell Miller uh, ran against him, uh, I voted for Herman. And uh, I suspect that uh, that election was the downfall of Lester's, uh, of, of Herman's administration because I, I remember all the stuff about the, the, the coat with the, with the $100 bills in it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where it's of that. I know that was some of the talk in, in the political circles. But uh, Tammage was a good public servant. And uh, I, I, I'm glad to have been able to call him a good colleague to work with. You worked with a lot of governors. Uh, you worked with President Carter when he was governor. Well, Carter, uh, Carter was uh, it's amazing about Carter made one bad mistake early on and he didn't make it the second time and that's was dealing with trying to trying to influence the curtailment of the market bulletin yeah, oh yes <laughs> i knew that was coming in this conversation and uh, he uh he uh gonna do it budget wise and i uh i felt so strong I, I run a front page story and right in the middle of the page urging people to contact the legislators to make sure that he could not cut the money out of the budget for the market bulletin. Tell the folks what the market bulletin is. Well, it's a publication that uh, it's, you'd have to really get it to, to really understand it, how strong a constituency that it has of its own. Uh, our readership uh, it's on the it's on the internet now, so we don't we know the hits. We've always figured it has somewhere around anywhere from three quarters to a million readers a, a week. It goes out every other week now, every, so we say every other week. And uh, and the people love it. And I don't care in any sizable congregation I get, and you allow some get up and says, we really appreciate the market bulletin, but it's a it's a touch of paper. It's, I changed the name of Market Bulletin to Farmers and Consumers Market Bulletin because I wanted to give it a consumer stage. But uh, if you have something you want to sell, needlework, patchwork, pliers, plants, uh, it, it, has a, it has an economic uh, uh, benefit to, to, to our state of, of several hundred million dollars a year. We haven't had a survey done recently to see what it is now, but if you got something you want, or you got a piece of farm equipment, or you want to buy a piece of farm equipment, uh, market bulletin will sell it for you, or it'll find it for you. And it's it's a great publication. And unfortunately, the budget folks uh, cut it to where I could only send out every other week back when the Republicans got in in charge. But I don't think they'll mess with it anymore. I think they see the value of it now. Well, I get it, and I'll read it religiously. I'm not a farmer, but there are a lot of things in there that are of great interest to me. George Busby. Well, Busby and I were in the same, fla same class that came to the state legislature in 1900, and 57, and went took off in 58. And uh, no, no, took off in, elected 56, took off in 57. I uh, get those dates right. correct. It's long ago, you kind of forget the semantics of things. But uh, Busby was a good governor to work with. I, I didn't have any problems with any of them. 
that, that one thing with Carter was only uh, only uh, disagreement I had with him, and I was able to help him on a lot of things after that. And I, I, I go to bat to help the governor on everything again. The current governor, uh, I've told him, I told him uh, as we started our second year, I said, you and I are going to be retiring at the same time. I like to do everything I can to see that we both leave on, on a high and not on a low. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that has had some influence with him and in recommending to go along with us in China. You know, the governor's the governor in a powerful position. And I think, it, I think, but he can't do it all by himself. He needs, needs people like myself who are willing to, to, to help him. I'm on the Georgia Finance Investment Commission board with him, and, and that's a very powerful committee, as, as you well know. And uh, he, uh, he's been all right to work with. Uh, I don't play the partisan as much as, as, as some of my Republican friends do. I, I tell folks I don't know a thing in the world that the Georgia Department of Agriculture does that's partisan. We serve people. And I preach it every day when I'm having staff meetings with my staff that keep in sight, if we do a good job of serving the public, uh, they'll give us credit for it. And that's the best politics you can have. People say you're doing your job and doing it well. I, I, I don't go anywhere in, in Georgia. I don't run into people who come to me and say, I've never met you before. I'm glad to meet you. I want to come up and tell you I appreciate the great job you've been doing for us. That makes you, that, 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 that makes you feel good. What is, uh, speaking of uh, Republicans, what is your take on the great rise in strength of the Republican Party in Georgia? Well, I, I, think, the, I think the biggest mistake Democrats have made is let their bench get thin. You know what that is. That's good know. quality people that want to run for public office. You know, I, apparently I was a good young man when I ran, and and I was willing to work hard and willing to be committed, and people vote for me. But if you don't keep recruiting people into the into the system, uh, you can get where you don't have enough good high quality people seeking office. Uh, to to prevail, uh, I uh, I don't I don't have an earthly idea who whether the, um, the Democrat or Republican will 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 succeed me or not, but I would urge either one of them to not run basically on a party label, but run on a on a service label. And say, say if you like me, I'll do you a good job, and I won't let partisan politics get in the way. I think a lot of people are getting sick and tired of how partisan things have gotten. I don't believe I'm totally misreading it either. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, a lot of partisanship. Well, I think the general public is is sort of uh, angry with politics and government anyway. Uh, you take this, this is an election year. It's been going on now for how long? Two years? Fifteen months, I believe I heard, uh, last night. Fifteen months we put up with the presidential uh, race this year. And I picked up the paper this morning and found out that uh, people have already announced for governor of Georgia the next election, which is what, uh, three or four years away, three years away. Well, I hadn't read the paper. So you've got, uh, you know, people are tiring of politics. And I think that... Uh, that uh, leaders in each party ought to understand that and, and uh, attempt to satisfy the public. And uh, that's going to take a lot of leadership to do. As I mentioned earlier on, I think there's been a, there's been a time in, in my past career as a public servant that I chose to run for governor. I'd have been a good candidate. And I, I think there may have been a time or two that I could have probably run and won. But see, I never did want it, as I mentioned. And... Uh, I, I'm going to urge whoever runs for, for my office, and there will probably be several run, don't get embedded in partisan politics. Tell them, tell the people what you're going to do with the department. You're going to inherit a good department because I'm going to make sure of that. And I, I'd like to see you take it and build on what you will take charge of. 
Always new, new eyes can see things to improve. It won't make me jealous. I want to see them do, do better. And if they'll do that, and they, and they get elected, if they choose, they can be elected a second or third time. I, I know I was asked this question on, on numerous occasions. What do I contribute to the fact that I've been elected again and again and again? As you mentioned early on, 10 different times statewide. That's a, that's a, that's a big record for Georgia. And that's a record for the, for the nation. And uh, I think the fact is I've been focused on my job. Put that first. And if you do your job, uh, that'll, that'll be the best PR you can have on election day. As you look back on your career, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment? Well, I didn't mention it a while ago. I think my, one of the greatest things I was able to, to accomplish was not in agriculture, was in, uh, in education. Uh, I was uh, author of the Constitutional Amendment that Dick Russell was author of the school lunch program at the federal level, and I was author of the Constitutional Amendment that funded and set the program up in Georgia at the state level. And that had to be voted on, two-thirds of the House and Senate, had to be voted on statewide, and it, it passed. That, that was probably the thing that I still point as one, one of my number one greatest achievements. The next one that probably got more attention was my efforts to, to eradicate the bow wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, bow wheel run the cotton out of a lot of places in Georgia, including the northern part of our state. And it's made cotton come back like gangbusters. And so I'm very proud of, uh, proud of that. I, I would expect to, one of the things early on that I was able to, 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 to Developed a program that came to the national program was, was getting rid of hog cholera. Uh, not too many, many people are going to see this, this video. Uh, can ever remember what you, one of the saddest signs you used to see the TV cameras humming when you see people killing hundreds of hogs and burying them because they had hog cholera. Mm -hmm. It was a sad sight. And we got rid of that. And we got rid of two burgers, locus and dairy herds. Got a loose brucellosis, that's called bang disease, and cattle herds. Mm -hmm. And we had a string of great successes that uh, I think is, uh, I, I can reminisce in my old age and say, well, I had a part in that. Yeah. What but, is your biggest but, disappointment? Very few, and I say most of my disappointments was, uh, was, was small. Uh, one was disappointment that I lost part of the funding for the market building, as I mentioned early on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't had many strong disappointments. I, I may have had some things that I could have done better, but I did the best I could. And I think I did. I always look at it like this. If you really focus on what you're doing and really get into it and get, get you Ranged in your hands, you can always do whatever it is as good as anyone else. And that's all that can ever be expected of anyone. And if you loosen up on the reins, that's when things can go awry and some things can happen that you, you wouldn't want to see happen. I tried to make sure I didn't have much of that to happen in my many years. I, uh, I know that. Uh, Howard Overby from Gainesville. Uh, when I was trying to get my constitutional amendment approved to have his school lunch program, he came up and tapped me on the shoulder and whispered in my ear, says, you're not doing too well with your question. It says, ask that your bill be recommitted to committee. I had so much confidence in the question. Why did I, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me move that this bill be recommitted to committee. Then he called me off the side and said, you weren't doing well, so you need to get, get, get busy and study your own proposal and be where you can answer any questions that they will throw at you. Because if you don't, you can't ever get a constitutional amendment passed because you know, it takes two thirds of the votes. And I did a good enough job and it came back up. I don't think I had one or two votes cast against it. That was, a, that was somebody telling me something I'd done wrong and told me how to correct it. Yes. You 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 gotta have you gotta have friends to be on the lookout for you. 
I think the greatest thing you can have as a public official is to have some people in every community that keeps keep you informed what's going on in that community. It's a big old state. And, and you know, I, I don't get to Young Harris that often. I don't live that far away. But I need to know what's going on over here, and I'm glad we got you around to keep me informed. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. How would you like to be remembered? You know, uh, you could say a lot of things. I think the thing that would be best to be remembered is that you did a good job and there never been any hint in any way of anything improper. You know, people this day and time always got to hand in somebody else's pocket or, or dipping in the till. And I think the fact that I've been able to be in public office as long as I have and never been a hint of anything improper, it's been a challenge. Because, you know, you don't always have to do it yourself to get accused of it. If you allow it to happen under your administration, we've had some people we've had to prosecute. And, and that's going to happen regardless. But we, we will not allow anybody to be in our administration and stay there if you're doing something that's improper. And I, I would think that finish your long tenure. And uh, as we mentioned, if I say the end of this term will be counting school board all together be 55 years and have that with city progress, great accomplishments, and did it without any hint of anything improper. As good as you could ask for. Well, you've certainly done that. Well, thank you. Question. What's the state doing in regards to the our hemlock destruction? Let me let me rephrase it for that. What is the state doing uh, toward solving the hemlock destruction problem? Georgia Forest Commission's in charge of that, and uh, I, I'm very familiar with how devastating it could be. But we don't have any, any real authority in that field. Uh, one time in the past. Uh, and that's during the, the Carter administration. There was a proposal to transfer that agency to the Department of Agriculture, but it never did happen. And I didn't want to get claimed to being out trying to grab around and build an empire, so I didn't fight to get it. But it could have probably been adequately served in our field. Because I get asked that question quite often. And another thing, a lot of people think we have some great influence over the county agents. They, they're, they're a product of the University of Georgia College of Agriculture. But I'd like to see it given some attention. And I may get an opportunity to tell their commissioner that question was asked to me here, here today. I keep seeing things and hearing things, reading stories about the collapse of the uh, Honey bee. Uh, yeah, that's been a that's been a, a real mystery to to everybody in the field. Uh, you know, I'm not sure the scientists have found out yet what's causing that. We're involved in that because we we you know we have to inspect honeybees. But we every disease we've had up to now, we've been able to eventually get it pretty well under control. But right now. My, my staff tells me they don't know what's causing it. And, and the dean of the College of Agriculture tells me the same thing. And I'm not sure we have a, have a solution to that yet. But it's absolutely necessary that we have our bees to survive. Because you could not have all these things, good things we've been talking about, could not be grown if you didn't have bees to do the pollination. That's another thing. A lot of people don't realize how important pollination is, but if you don't have pollination, you don't have production. No more questions? Is there any chance you will run for another term? Well, let's say it's my intention to retire. Uh, the old saying is, don't ever say never. Because you might change your mind, but I'd have to have a drastic change, drastic change of mind um, before I would uh, ever even think about considering running again. 
I say that because I think we'll have some qualified people that will run. If, if, if some of the people I've heard mentioned will, will give it serious consideration and run, it's people that I, that I could support. And that's all I want. You know, I will, I will be uh, in my 80s. And uh, it's time to retire. And I can give you a little sidebar. I've done had the analysts do it. My take on pay will go up substantially from my pension to just from my salary. <laughs> what thoughts do you have on the current Democratic presidential primary? Well, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was a friend of Bill Clinton's. He, uh, he, uh, he called me occasionally. A lot of people says didn't think presidents ever called anybody, but he called me occasionally. And uh, he, uh, I remember one time at the governor's mansion and when he was president, he came down the line and when he, uh, I, I'd give a little, little whisper in his ear and I had a little thing I'd do sometimes. I'd get about uh, two or three bars in a, in, a, in a memorandum and put it in an envelope and I'd see him. I'd say, sick is in your pocket, have time to read it. I found out he read it and responded to it. And uh, so I had, a, I, had a, I had a dialogue with him. And uh, he, uh, he called me recently and asked me to meet him in Atlanta and wanted me to go down to Mercer and introduce him at Mercer College. And I accepted that invitation. So if, if, if my position, which I understand is pretty solid to be a delegate, uh, I will vote for Hillary. That, that begs this question. The Democratic Party has, of course, the superdelegates, which uh, can and probably will decide the outcome of this election. Do you think those superdelegates should have the power to override uh, their constituency? Well, I, I don't think you're going to see much of that in Georgia. From what I look like, the people's already declared it's going to be pretty well along the lines of, that, that, uh, that they voted. I know my home county went two to one for, for Hillary, right. where I live. Right. So I can say I, I voted for my constituency where I live. Right. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting aspect. And, you know, the 9th district, excuse me, the, 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 the 10th district, which I live in, is a, really a Republican district. Mm -hmm. But I carried it solid in my last election. It tells me that they will vote for per the person. I, uh, I can't get a real good feeling for it. Uh, uh, I think the Republicans are not going to give up the president the presidency without a big heavy fight. It's not going to be easy for anyone to take that job. But I think they've got a weak candidate. I think he could have done better. But I didn't have part in choosing that, so I should keep my uh, mouth shut. <laughs> other questions? Well, thank you very much, Commissioner Irving. It's been a great pleasure to have you. I want to thank you on behalf of the ICL, uh, Young Harris College, and uh, Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you, Bob. It's been a great pleasure to have known you throughout the years and to have the opportunity to work with you so closely through the real formative years of me getting into leadership positions. And I always value that friendship. Well, thank you.